everybody. I'm happy to be here and talk about brownfields and why I think they're such an important solution for our challenging times. I'm really glad to be here. My name is Meredith Williams. I'm the director for the Department of Toxic Substances Control. And I've been in that role for about a year and a half. And to be honest, I often quote a, a report from CCLR that says that there may be as many as 150,000 to 200,000 contaminated sites around the state. It's a pretty daunting task. And while I quote that, um, that report all the time, I really haven't had a chance to dig into CCLR and and what the organization does. And so once I had the chance to do that, I found it to be very exciting and I was even more pleased to be able to participate in this conference. Because of what you do, what you do is embed sustainability in the, the programmatic approaches to redeveloping brownfields and, um, and creating affordable housing. Expanding resources so that local entities and um, nonprofits can get the most out of the limited dollars that they have. And of course, bringing people together at workshops like this. And I do think that this is a theme that I'll explore today, which is intersectionality, working across um, disciplines, perspectives, and multiple dimensions. And this is something that obviously is already very much a part of how you're approaching this conference and the work. And what I think that means is that you as participants are well positioned to bring solutions that are needed in this moment. Our governor often talks about what it means to meet this moment. And this moment means addressing problems related to housing, climate, racial equity, and economic impacts. So let's explore the, that, what this moment looks like and then talk about solutions. Of course, our housing problem was well understood well before 2020. It was front and center. California's major metropolitan areas are well known to have what we call a severe rent burden where people are paying more than 50% of their income. And, and that happens much more in California than in other places in the country. If you look at the number of unhoused people in the country, 50% of those folks are in California. And if we look at the number that we think of how the amount of housing we think we need, we think we need 1.4 million additional affordable housing units. A pretty daunting task and probably not news to you. But of course, as 2020 has come along, even before 2020, there was um, a good understanding of how zip code can dictate your outcomes, your life expectancy, how your pregnancy will go, whether or not you'll have a, a baby with a healthy birth weight or whether you're at risk for maternal mortality even. Additionally, old housing stock is, continues to be a challenge where people are dealing with lead paint or lead pipes if supplying their drinking water. And of course, Robert Moses gave us the gift of putting transportation corridors right through um, communities of color and, and our cities creating um, respiratory burdens and other challenges for these communities. So these are things that were already well understood and then 2020 hit. And 2020, of course, has been challenging. I hate to go over it again, you're all familiar with it, but I am gonna talk about it. If you were blissfully unaware of the challenges of racial inequity, that ignorance was ripped off like a warm blanket on a cold day. And you know the murder of George Floyd really shone a light on racial inequity and the challenges with the criminal justice system. And flowing from that, we've seen an even more understanding of what communities are facing and how they're suffering from the burdens, not just of the criminal justice system, but of disparate environmental impacts. Coronavirus, again, brought that into relief as these same communities face double-digit employment, and we're hit even harder with this sudden economic downturn. Twice as many people in a disadvantaged community are working in, a, in the service sector. That means they're essential workers. They're not able to telecommute. They're not able to um, protect themselves from the virus. And then you add on those housing pressures of higher housing density and pre-existing health conditions. And really, it's quite a burden. 
course, this is nothing new for communities who've been fighting for environmental justice over the years. They've lived with this, they've struggled, uh, struggled against it, and you know, they've learned to live with the uncertainty that comes from these disparate impacts. And they've had to fight to have their um, considerations, their concerns taken seriously. And I think now it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to take those challenges and start to address them in new ways. So 2020 was already going well, and then climate decided that we needed to really understand its impact. And so we have been experiencing the wildfires. Again, well before the wildfires, studies were saying that climate was placing additional disparate burden on disadvantaged populations. And the extreme weather events and disasters or working, weakening environmental structures of communities. If you think about how many people left New Orleans to go live in Houston, for instance, and lost their, their social networks, it's really been very impactful. The wildfires have come along and they show us that, you know, people are forced to live at the margins of the wildlands in order to be able to afford housing. And then that creates another transportation burden. And of course, the end result of all these fires is going to be further displacement and exacerbation of the housing crisis. So there are plenty of challenges. I can say that for the Department of Toxic Substances Control, we're looking at these, we're trying to tackle these problems head on. We have a strategic plan that talks about environmental justice and has specific actions to tackle it. But our work would be much more impactful if we're working as a united force with other partners. Governor Newsom strongly advocates, he's very serious about creating a California for all. And so let's think about what we can do together. As frustrating as 2020 is, we know that we all can feel more empowered when we act, when we have a sense of agency. And through this conference, you're going to see solutions. And CCLR does provide solutions. A lot of you do. And I think that those solutions are made more powerful by the fact that they are working at intersections. There's an intersectionality of people. And there's brownfields inherently are, are intersectional spaces, places. Let's talk about that. We have to work along multiple dimensions in order to solve the problems that are at hand. We have a housing problem, a climate problem, a racial equity problem, and coming out of the pandemic, we have an, an economic problem, jobs problem. So how do you solve problems well? One of the best ways to solve problems is to tackle it with diversity. And by that, I mean diversity, again, across multiple dimensions. People tend to think about racial diversity, but it's important to look at other types of diversity too, life experiences. I remember working in the private sector and having a lot of former military folks on, on our teams and how incredibly powerful that was in terms of their bringing their, their experience to our problem solving. Cognitive diversity. And when I say cognitive diversity, I'm talking about both in terms of how people process information and what perspective they take. A lot of people process information based on what they know, what their experience is, and it's hard to get outside of that. But imagine the power if you're not thinking of just your experience, but bringing to bear the experience of other people and bringing that together to solve a problem. And perspective. If you're trained as an attorney, you're going to think like an attorney. I'm trained as a scientist. I just gravitate to how the science, scientific mind works. Engineers, perspective, did you grow up poor? Did you grow up rich? All these things, all these dimensions, if you can have a wealth of perspectives, you're going to find richer, more fruitful solutions. And even go so far as to think about communications diversity. Our introverts need time to gather information, maybe think ahead of a meeting to be able to share things or to be able to respond in writing afterward. Think about all the different ways in which people want to communicate and make room for all of those folks. So I encourage you to question what diversity means within your organization. What differences do you encourage? What differences could you cultivate even more? 
And the reason I'm not saying that because it's the right thing to do, I'm saying it because, again, all the studies say that diverse problem solvers innovate more, find more creative solutions, and they actually solve problems faster. And as I said, we at DTSC are trying to solve a lot of problems, but so are you, whether you're a developer, a local planner, um, a housing organization, and it's important for us to come together to, and try to solve these problems. We have this opportunity to solve problems in broad and creative ways and tackle, again, these four problems, five problems all at once. I do think that brownfields are a really good place to find solution. It's a great opportunity to meet multiple needs. You can build new affordable housing. You can build it with materials that might be safer than lead paint and, and you know, think about how to build climate smart buildings. Um, you can think about public transportation access. And of course, through the brownfields process, you can create jobs, both in terms of doing the remediation, but then construction jobs come and then whatever's put on top of that property can be an engine, an engine for economic um, growth. I have the pleasure of working in the Cal EPA building in Sacramento. And my, my windows face northward and I get to watch the work at the Sacramento rail yards. If you're not familiar, it is it's 240 acres of very contaminated organic and inorganic um, solvents and, and chemicals that were left behind from the functions of an old rail, railroad terminal. It's now slated for something like 6,000 to 10,000 housing units. And I can see out my window, I can see the soccer stadium location and where the new hospital and the new courthouse are slated to go. If you ask me, that sounds like it could be a very vibrant place to live and it could be climate friendly, give people an easy way to get to, the, to for instance, the Bay Area by taking the train. That's one example. Let me share another one. In Carson, California, ETSC oversaw the remediation of a former landfill. In case you're not aware, Carson is one of the top five percentile of environmental justice communities in California. That's based on what we call Cal Enviro Screen, which takes a number of environmental indicators and looks at each census tract and figures out how big their environmental burden is and ranks, ranks them. So Carson is highly impacted and there's this former landfill site in, in Carson. And that, has now been turned into the Porsche Experience Center where people can go and test ride Porsches and have a day of it. That center itself created 135 jobs with an annual income of $6.8 million. In addition, the ripple effects are that that generates more than $45 million in revenue output for Southern California. Now, I will say I'm not sure it's a climate solution, but I'm hopeful that they're driving electric Porsches because the torque is so great. The last example I want to mention is uh, Jordan Downs, and that's in the community of Watts in LA, which most of you know is a very highly um, economically depressed and, um, and a community that could really use a break. There are 21 acres that were contaminated in that community. And there was, there's a, a, an affordable housing development that's already in place there, but it's a pretty old housing stock and there was a need to revitalize it. Well, in the process of figuring out how to remediate that and turn it into new housing stock, the project was done in a way that really had tremendous community involvement. Then, and as a result, the community got to say, we want a grocery, we want some green space, we want it to be walkable. In the end, there will be 1,800 residential units, 700 of those units will be affordable housing, and 700 will be public housing. When they put the plan together and the community participated, they came up with a goal of 30% local hires to participate in, in job training programs. 
And what I love about this project is they worked hard to minimize displacement. So rather than having all this um, gentrification or gentrification, the people who lived there got to stay there. And that means their community remains intact and their structures are in place and they can continue to be part of their neighborhood and support each other. So those are three examples of the power of brownfields. Look, 2020 will not last forever and the coronavirus will not last forever. And we will come out of it and we will have opportunities to create solutions and to move forward in positive ways. As you attend the conference, if you haven't already, I encourage you to think about diversity of your attendance. Go to a session that you might not normally thought of attending. Um, reach out to a speaker that you thought had something interesting to say on a topic you were unfamiliar with. Seek out that diversity and then think about how to use it for to solve multiple problems at once in the work that you do. I come from a corporate background and we always say invest during a downturn. And this is a downturn that really warrants investment. Invest in better building materials, get rid of formaldehyde, look for the low VOCs, um, really think about sustainable, uh, healthy materials for all buildings, not just the high-end developments, but really can't, shouldn't our affordable housing be healthy? Invest in each other train each other, share what you know with one another in events like this, uh, like this conference. Invest in relationships, invest in collaboration. I know that you can collaborate and I'm encouraging you to do it. I think it's already built into the nature of this conference and to CCLR and to all of you who work in this, this space. And it's clear that you know how to collaborate because I understand that at the end of the conference, you will all be participating in the world famous Brownfield sing along. So I hope you harmonize together and keep that beautiful music going as you move forward. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today.